to Associate Vice President of Academic Operations, Manuel Gomez. Thank you, Alexa. I am Manuel Gomez, uh, your AVP for Academic Operations. Um, and it's a pleasure to be visit with you and introduce our two presenters. Ms. Brenda Whalen, uh, she's our Deputy CIO for Enterprise Applications, and Ms. Lourdes Cruz, she's the Executive Director for Student Information Services. Today's webinar is designed to give us an update on the work to adapt Banner, which is our student information system to serve us under a new paradigm for city state. A lot of good work has been completed and a significant number of projects associated with the integration of technologies is currently underway. Our panelists uh, represent some of the departments and colleagues who worked to plan our transitions and future implementations of new processes and resources. And Ms. Brenda Welling will get us started. The first section we're going to review is the project overview. What is the One College Banner Project? One College, uh, sorry, not advancing. There we go. The One College Banner Project includes the transition from the 12 college banner into the new streamlined, standardized, and simplified instance of CT State's banner, as well as the implementation of the other third party products. The project encompasses more than just Banner. In addition to standing up a new instance of Banner, CT State is simultaneously implementing the one college version of products shown below. There are just a few balls in the air. Many view the transition of one college Banner as an IT project, when in fact it is a CT State initiative highly dependent upon the balance of people, process, and technology to achieve success. To date, more than 150 staff from across the 12 campuses, CT State Central Office, CSCU System Office, and Shared Services have participated in the project. Without the people in the processes that define and drive the banner configuration, banner would be an empty shell. In today's world, without banner and our th other third party, products, CT State would not have the administrative tools necessary to support all the activities shown here. Over the next two months, it will be imperative that decisions are made quickly, deadlines are met, and all activities related to the project are given the highest priority. Success is a must. Why does CT State need a new banner instance? When Banner was first implemented in the mid-90s, it was heavily modified to support the 12 college model. Although an eloquent solution at the time, over the years as the Banner suite of software has evolved, the 12 college solution prevented the adoption of newer functionality and fully leveraging existing features. The new one college Banner environment addresses the data migration needs of CT State, eliminates a significant number of customizations and positions CT State to launch the modernized Banner 9 self-service functionality. How is One College Banner accessed? One College Banner is accessed from the protective enclave via the Applications tab, similar to how 12 College Banner is accessed today. Will there still be X accounts and college-specific accounts? No. In one college banner, all the data is owned by CT State and is no longer restricted by campus. Finance still leverages fund org security, limiting access as appropriate. However, since students are enrolled at CT State, any user with student data access will be able to view all students regardless of their home campus. Who can access one college banner? Privileges to access one college banner are being managed by the functional needs and granted on an as need basis. Timing of access will align with testing and scheduled go live activities of the various modules. Due to changing roles and responsibilities within CT State, a user's one college banner access will likely differ from their previous access. The banner access request and approval process is under review and will be revised to align with the structure of CT State. Will all 12 college banner data be migrated to one college banner? No, some but not all of the data will be migrated. 
It will vary depending on the banner module. Let's take a deeper dive. In May 2022, approximately 1.7 million general person records and their associated demographic and biographic data were imported into one college banner. Since the initial load, a daily process executes identifying all new or changed person information in 12 college banner and synchronizes the data with one college banner. The synchronization is one way, 12 college banner to one college, minimizing the potential for creating duplicates in the CT state instance. The finance data migration was minimal. The CSU system office's 12 college banner chart of accounts was carried forward unchanged. All vendors with purchase orders or payment activity since July of 2019 were, were migrated and fixed asset information was converted into one college banner. CT State will begin processing financial aid as of aid year 23-24. Data migrated from 12 college banner to one college banner for financial aid is limited to the list shown here. Of all the modules, banner student is the most complex. This slide provides a high level summary of the student module data that will be migrated from 12 college banner to CT State. Detail codes are the heart of student accounts receivable module and are necessary to support the tuition and fee assessment process. In one college banner, detail codes and fee assessment rules will be simplified, reducing the total number of codes from over 5,000 to just under 400. With the uh, uh, transition to one college banner, we're seeing these types of simplification, standardizations, and efficiencies in many areas. From a data migration perspective, the only data that will be carried forward for AR are the student account balances. Balances as of June 27, 2023 will look, be loaded into the one college banner on July 1st. The information will be broken into three categories shown here for the student accounts. All entries will include a two character campus code, such as MA for Manchester, CA for capital, et cetera, in the transaction description to indicate the source of the balance. This information is being provided as a point of reference, outlining the completed and scheduled 12 college to one college production data migration. The slides that follow will provide an overview of the project's go live milestones. Shown here is a high level overview of the go live milestones for the entire one college banner project. In the upcoming slides, I will review the highlights quarter by quarter, but before we move on, Take a moment to comprehend the big picture. Note the modules flagged with the red asterisks. Each asterisk is an indication that the specified component will be running in two environments. Student, faculty, and staff will continue to access the 12 college versions for all activities related to the spring and summer 2023 semester, while at the same time, the CT State versions will be live and operational to support all fall 2023 activities. In July of 2022, finance was the first Connecticut State banner module to go live. Key changes during the implementation included a new chart of accounts designed to support financial transaction and reporting for CT State. Banner 9 self-service online requisitions and approval functionality was deployed along with the ability to attach supporting documents leveraging the Highland on-based document imaging functionality. It should be noted that CT State is the first institution within CSCU that has implemented Banner 9 finance self-service. Today, online requisitions and approval functionality is being leveraged at the CT State Central Office, CSCU System Office, and six of the 12 campuses. The remaining campuses will be onboarded in the upcoming months. Training is available every Tuesday at 11 and 2, now through March. HR and payroll went live in August when the first payroll for fiscal 23 was processed, feeding the data from core CT through the banner HR payroll module and into finance. Today, eight of 10 payrolls have been processed and the recoding and chart field two banner admin forms are now available at the campus. It has not been all sunshine and rainbows, but by bringing the team to the table to focus on the process and technology, the issues should be behind us. 
The first student module components to go live were the catalog were cataloging curriculum. In September, Elucian loaded the CT State undergraduate and workforce development catalogs and programs into one college banner. Academic operations and workforce development are in the process of validating and revising the data as needed. Academic operations is also recognized reconciling the banner catalog with the online catalog published via Acalog. On October 1st, 2022, CT State began accepting applications for fall 2023. As of December 3rd, 2022, CT State has 5,670 opportunities in the admissions funnel. A nomination for CT State's CRM recruit implementation has been submitted to Elucian for an impact award. If selected, CT State will receive a $25,000 institutional grant. Financial aid went live the first week of November. As of December 5th, 1,712 aid applications have been received. On December 2nd, 6,520 faculty and advisor records were imported from 12 college banner into one college banner. The data migration was limited to instructors with teaching assignments and or advisors with assigned advisees since fall of 2018. End to end testing the final validation of the one college banner environment configuration is scheduled the week of February 20th. The test plan will exercise all banner and third party application functionality from admissions to degree completion and end of term processing. At the conclusion of the end to end testing, the CT state AVPs that have been involved with the project will be, be required to sign off and approve the production data migration and go live. In IT speak, this is the go, no go decision. Mid March will be an exciting time as the following applications are launched in production. Credit registration for fall 2023 semester will open on April 4th. Workforce development will open April 10th for the 2023-2024 offerings. Student accounts receivable and TouchNet will go live in July. All billing and payment activities will be offline June 28th through July 3rd, while the account balances are loaded and reconciliation occurs. Fee assessment and bills will be generated beginning July 5th. In mid-July, the necessary steps will be taken to merge the data from 12 college CRM advise environment into the one college environment. Once validated, CT State CRM advise will be operational and the 12 college environment will be shut down. Also beginning in July, all events and room reservations pertaining to the fall 2023 semester and beyond will be entered in the new cloud hosted events management system, EMS. August 29th, 2023, CT state classes begin. They'll be here before we know it. Are we ready? This concludes my portion of the presentation. My colleague, Laura Des Cruz, will provide an overview of key configuration changes for the student module. Laura Des, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brenda. Um, so just like the slide says, remain calm. It's still banner. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's still the same banner that you're used to. It's the same look and the feel with improved amenities. Um, many of you are familiar with our term codes used today in which the first digit refers to the century. The next two digits refers to the year and the fourth digit refers to the semester, leaving the last two digits I, um, which identify the college. Um, for example, if we were talking about the fall 2022 semesters, um, if I referenced 122302, my colleagues at Manchester Community College would know I was referencing one of their terms. Another lovely amenity is workforce development now has the freedom to control their own term. They're not confined to the credit standards of operations. They will have a separate term code for, um, for their, uh, their information. The term codes um, we have are for workforce development will be a year long 
uh, term code as well as for concurrent enrollments. Um, fall 2023 um, is a credit term along with the winter, spring, and summer. Term codes will be standardized and follow the academic year standardization, similar to that used by financial aid. For example, um, for academic year 2023-2024, the academic year in the term code will include 2024. The last two digits um, of the term desig will designate uh, whether it's part of the workforce development term, the concurrent term, or the credit terms. So if you look at the slide, um, the fifth and sixth term designator, if it ends in 00, zero you're looking at a workforce development term. If it ends in 03, you're looking at a concurrent enrollment term. And if you're looking at any of the credit terms, it will end in either 10, 20, 40 or 50, which um, are reflected by fall, winter, spring, or summer. Our parts of term will also be standardized and not defined by campus nor used to identify populations. Uh, as a former registrar, I had to keep track of a number of parts of terms. That meant I had to have a separate academic processing schedule for each part of term that I had. This certainly simplifies the parts of terms and makes it easier for uh, easier for campuses to manage. Next slide, please. Our level codes are no longer differentiated by college. We currently identify credit level work at the various colleges by using the college letter letter and the number one. For example, if you're um, at one of the colleges, you might have a credit level of B1, which was associated with Manchester Community College, C1, which is associated with Northwestern Community College, D1, Norwalk Community College, and all the way down the line to M1, which is as Nuntuck. So each college had a letter designated, and if it was assigned to one, it was a credit level. Moving forward to Connecticut State, the level that represents credit will be that undergraduate level or what we refer to as the UG level. For workforce development, we will be going through a similar transition. Workforce development course levels in the 12 college banner included the college level and the number two to identify the students who were enrolled in non-credit courses and programs. For example, B2, C2, D2, all the way through M2 Moving forward, workforce development uh, levels will encompass three levels. So they're going from one level to three levels. In the one college, they'll have business and industry level, personal enrichment, workforce development. Next uh, slide, please. In the 12 college, we have the alphanumeric program codes that are college specific for um, for each of the campuses. So, for example, it really didn't make a lot of sense to most people. For example, if we were talking about a TAP program at Naugatuck Valley, um, one of the codes assigned to the um, art studies program is the H12HG21. I know um, many of you uh, probably say, well, what does that mean? It really only meant something to someone at Naugatuck Valley because they could um, identify with the code. In the one college, the credit program codes are set up to include the major, the degree, and at times the area of studies or the TAP programs. So if you're looking at the program examples, you can see that we have the accounting AS degree, and we have also the accounting um, certificate. And if you go the third one down is the TAP program. So the TAP is actually part of the program code um, for our general studies and liberal arts and science program. Um, those also include the area of studies. So those program codes will include the area of studies, which um, we have six, which is the arts and humanities, the business and hospitality, engineering and technology, nursing and health careers, social and behavioral science, and sciences and mathematics. Um, in the one college, we already have 
301 program codes set up. There's 139 Associates of Science program codes, 36 Associate of Arts, 13 Associates of Applied Science, and 113 credit certificate programs. Next slide, please. Workforce development is a little bit different from credit program codes as they have one program code for multiple majors. So currently when you, you're, um, you're used to seeing the alphanumeric program codes, um, which again, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense unless you're a part of that campus. Um, if we were talking about a food program at Naugatuck Valley, um, the program code would be H23HQFO. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and it's associated with the major institutional food worker, um, which has HQFS and um, which again, if you didn't know the program, you'd have to search for it. The major, you would have to search for it. Um, so, in the one college, the naming convention is um, a little bit easier. Um, for workforce development, their naming convention is they have an un umbrella category followed by the WD designation and the major code if applicable. For example, if you're looking at the administrative office procedures um, program code, the a AOP WD. Uh, program code. This includes multiple majors, so you can select um, administrative medical assistant as a major or medical office assistant or patient navigator. Um, we used to identify workforce development programs as a priority to many of the folks in the registrar's office know what I'm talking about. Um, but in the one college, this will be switching to a priority 80 because they'll have their own term code. So they'll have their own priority as well. Um, currently we have in the one college we have 65 workforce development programs which encompasses 113 majors next uh, slide please majors are also standardized in the one college banner there's no longer going to be the alphanumeric it doesn't make any sense you're really not going to know you know what hf PQ means. Um, so, uh, in the one college, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, so, the accounting major is ACCT, the auto is AUTO, and so on. Um, and many of the majors um, go over both uh, credit and workforce development. So, you'll see some of these um, majors within the program code for the UG level uh, program codes, and you'll see them in the workforce development uh, program codes as well. Next slide, please. The subject codes and course, course numbers will be standardized as well. There'll be no asterisk aster, after the subject code and no letter in front of the course number. Um, for example, many of you are used to seeing, you know, ENG asterisk G0101, which is an English composition course at um, Capital. That's no longer going to be um, available in the one college. You will see one subject code um, with no asterisk after it. Um, so, most of the subjects or discipline codes will be three or four letters. Subject codes can be shared within um, the UG and the workforce development. So, you'll see them um, in some cases, you'll see subject codes of EDUC education for both workforce development and in the undergraduate catalog. Next slide, please. Course numbers will be four digits and sat standardized as well. The first digit will indicate the level of the course. Courses that are designated 0899 or lower are workforce development courses and fall within either the workforce development, business and industry level, or the personal enrichment level. Courses that are um, within the range of 0900 
to 0999 are developmental courses. These courses, um, although they may earn credit, do not meet degree requirements. Courses that are um, from 1000 to 1999, these courses are used, usually taken as part of the first year of study program. Um, and many of these courses are prerequisites to more advanced or professional courses. The courses 2000 to 2999 are usually taken as part of the second year of study program um, and are usually usually have prerequisites and it's usually taken by a student who's matriculated in a certificate or degree program. The second digit can indicate a, spe a specific area of focus um, and usually this is determined by the discipline. Um, they'll make those decisions. Um, the third and fourth digit are sequential and do not have a specific meaning, except if in the case if they're in this reserved um, designator group. Um, these have already been identified um, for um, specific courses. So if you see these, these are the only ones that um, are uh, specific. Next slide, please. The CRNs or the course reference numbers were different depending on the campus. Some campuses use four digits CRNs, others used five digits CRNs. Moving to the Connecticut State, we're standardizing this and we're going to use the five digit CRN. For credit or UG level courses, the first two dig digits will represent the term designation. So if it starts with 10, it usually is a course that falls within the fall. So usually that would be 10,001 um, for the first CRN. If the number starts with 20, um, that's a winter course for credit. If it starts with, for, with 40, um, that's spring and 50 summer. Um, for, conc for the concurrent enrollment semester, the first two di digits will start with 70. So in addition to knowing that the term code for um, the concurrent semester will end with 03, this is an another quick way to know which um, term you're in or which students you're working with. Um, so the first two digits will be 70. If you're working with workforce development, if um, you're in that particular term code, um, you'll see that the CRNs will start with 80. So the first one will be 80,001. Next slide, please. Campus codes now represent actual locations. Um, so the two character alpha will represent the primary and satellite campus location. For example, AS for Asnuntuck, CA for Capital, DB for Danbury. Um, HSC will represent all high schools and the actual high school location will be maintained in the building code. So this information will still be available. Um, so that you know what high school uh, the person is taking the course at. The military locations will have a three character alpha code assigned to them. Um, that's not HSC. So um, the Navy submarine base will have NSB. Uh, the Coast Guard base will be CSB. The correctional facilities will have unique campus codes that begin with X. X representing the correctional facilities um, as seen in the example. So um, XCH would be Cheshire Correctional and so on. In addition, there will be uh, an OFF and an ONL campus representing off-campus sites and online course offerings. Next slide, please. So this is probably the one that you all want to know about. How will the home campus be assigned? For new students, this will be selected during their application process. For continuing students, um, this will be assigned during the data migration. Now, there are some criteria um, for the home campus designation. The first thing to keep in mind is that 
um, the home campus designation will only be assigned to students that have enrolled in one or more credit classes since fall of 2018. If the student has received financial aid since fall of uh, 2018, the college that award, awarded the aid will be designated as the student's home campus. It should be noted that if a student is enrolled in multiple colleges, aid can only be awarded by one institution, So, um, but can cover the cost of the other 11 community colleges through the consortium agreement. In the one college, they'll be um, awarded um, aid at one college in the one college, obviously. <laughs> um, if no, if students have only attended one single college and has not received financial aid, the last college the student was enrolled at will be designated as the student's home campus. If the student has attended multiple colleges since fall of 2008 and has not received financial aid, the college with the highest earned institutional credit will be designated as the student's home campus. If the student has um, not received financial aid and maybe has taken um, the same amount of credits at multiple campuses, then the last college the student attended will be designated as their home campus. Um, Next slide, please. So implications for the home campus, um, really this dictates the legacy college transcript that will become the foundation of Connecticut State's undergraduate level transcript. Residential degree requirements will only take into account institutional credits that were earned at the home campus or transferred to the home campus from any other 11 community colleges prior to fall of 2023. Next slide, please. So um, here's a scenario. We have a single student attending multiple colleges. They attended Manchester Community College and um, on their Manchester Community College transcript, they have 15 Manchester credits. They transferred into Manchester three Tunxes credits. They also have a record at Tunxes Community College and they took three credits at Tunxes and they transferred in an additional six credits from Eastern into Tunxes. In addition to that, they've taken three credits, I'm sorry, six credits at Three Rivers. So they have three legacy transcripts, essentially. Now, I know that you're asking which one would be the home college. Well, because Manchester Community College has a total of 18 credits, that would be the student's home college based on the number of credits that the student has earned. So. The only credits that would be reflected on the home college or their UG record would be that that was transferred to Manchester or the, that that was taken at Manchester. So the 18 credits would count towards residency and would be applied to financial aid. Next slide, please. Um, there are many people that have um, participated as uh, Brenda Whalen st stated before, there's about um, 150 people that have already participated. There'll be more that will participate um, in the future. These are just a few. Um, so next slide, please. The next steps is in January, we're going to finalize the security banner access in Connecticut State. Just please keep in mind that um, just because you have a certain access now in 12 College banner, when you go to uh, Connecticut State, your security may change and will reflect the role that you have in Connecticut State. 
in February, we will have our end to end testing and we will start off trainings for um, those folks that are in advising and in registration. And during the month of March through April, our trainings for um, one college banner will continue. And we'll also start rolling out our um, Connecticut state videos, which will take place. Um, my comnet will be replaced with my Connecticut state. It'll be very different and it's going to be very exciting. Um, and we'll start um, training videos for faculty and students. Um, with that, my presentation is over so we can go to the next slide. <laughs> And I think Benoit was going to. Oh, okay. Yes, so um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, we have several uh, congratulations, kudos, nice job uh, expressions, uh, and a couple of questions for our panelists and presenters. Uh, question number one Could we get the uh, CF2 numbers for each of our OR codes. I think uh, so. Charter field two numbers. Um, and I think this was just as we were getting into the codes uh, part of the presentation. Um, which the charter? No, this is a finance okay. question. Okay. Gail <laughs> O'Neill is on CF2. The call? Okay. Sure, I can answer that. So we have um, chart field twos are going to probably be totally reworked. Um, we want to make sure that we have a good naming convention as we move forward. Um, so we can work within the current environment that we have. If you need a chart field two, that um, that functionality is now working so that you can actually request new chart field twos, but it is likely at some point in time that we are going to be resurrecting and redoing all chart fields. So I would not wholesalely change all chart fields at your campus or um, because eventually, you know, as we move to CT state, there's going to be a need for for new chart field twos. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Uh, and question number two is, uh, will we still have access to EMS, the event management system? I will let Ryan take that one. Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, access um, to everyday users and desktop client users um, likely will not change. Um, it'll remain the same users on each campus. Simple answer. <laughs> Thank you. And the next question is um, regarding program codes. Is this at the student level or just at the course level? If a student, uh, regarding a student, can a student be business and industry and workforce at the same time? Sure, I can take that manual. Um, yes, a student should be able to be a BNI and a workforce student at the same time. They would most likely come in under workforce, but if their um, employer wanted to sign them up for a BNI course, they should, um, would be able to do that. Thank you. Um, we have a request for a handout regarding information connected with home campus and uh, we will be able to provide that as we move forward. Um, there's also a question regarding uh, when will we transition to from my comnet to CT state next uh, level. And I think at this point we're calling that experience, but when will that transition take place? I can take that one, Manuel. So the 
the underlying product is actually called the Lucian Experience, and we're in the process of uh, doing discovery and building out the content. We are going to be going live with what will be called My CT State in March of 2023. But between March of 23 and the end of August, both My Comnet and My CT State will be available. So for the most part, the focus for the incoming students, they're not going to know anything about my ComNet and they're all going to be directed towards using my CT state, which will be available from the CT state website. Whereas our continuing students will be finishing out the um, academic year for spring and summer 2023. All those activities will be in my ComNet and much like we've done for um, the online requisitions and approvals. For all our staff right now, even though it's accessing the CT state instance of Banner through self service, we actually have a portlet that's been built out on my ComNet. So there are things that we're looking into, and we're going to have some discussions with the steering committee um, later in December to talk about what's the best way to transition our continuing students. You know, do we want to say if you're registering for CT state, we're going to trans you know, point you to go to the CT State website and use uh, my CT State, or do we want to kind of slowly transition that population and allow them still to continue to access the different tools they need from my comment? Thank you. And I think this is a scheduling question. Um, will staff in the division offices still have access to Banner? And I think this question is coming from somebody who enters schedule and room information into Banner. So right. um, I w I'm not sure if um, Ryan wants to or if Jen, because um, it depends on uh, <laughs> what your role is in one college banner um, or in the uh, CT state, I should say. Um, so that will determine what type of access you have um, moving forward. So it depends on your role in Connecticut State Community College. I'm not sure if I answered that. Um, and Ryan just uh, sent a message via Teams that his uh, technology crashed. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so um, within the CT state, State structure, we will still have uh, colleagues at the campus level who will help enter or manage information connected with uh, events and rooms. Um, we will have colleagues who would support that type of uh, information management uh, connected with academics and also on the other side with uh, student life campus events. And as Lower just mentioned, um, access will depend on the type of role you are um, continuing to perform within the city state structure. And both are connected with banner and EMS. Uh, the second and the, the next question uh, is with regards to codes uh from high school students in banner and i'll probably butcher the pronunciation of some of these codes so with regards to the entry of high schools in s o a h s c h and college in s o a p c o l will the codes numbers change in one college banner or remain the same as in legacy So for the high school codes, they are not changing. They will remain the same six digits that they currently are. We have transitioned and uh, maybe Lourdes can speak a little bit more to it, but the college codes have been changed to uh, four digit college codes. So um, the, so the FICE codes, um, 
we're going to be um, using the. Um, oh, goodness, the. Uh, Seab. Yes, thank you. <laughs> the FICE codes will be for colleges will be changing to the Seab code. Um, so that's the only change um, you will still be able to. Um, see the FICE code and still search by the FICE code. Um, but um, because um, the FICE code is no longer used, we're moving to the SEEB code as um, the college designation. Um, so, but you'll be able to um, locate all that information. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, next question is also connected with uh, With codes and it says, will we be able to run the same extra extracts in one college banner that we currently run in legacy? It will depend on the process. We are in the um, working through a review of all the custom reports. And if it's an actual process that's updating data in banner, it, if it's deemed needed to move forward because a lot of things that we have were processes that were created because of the 12 college solution and as a single institution would no longer be needed. And then in the case of the reports, I'm going to turn it over to JD to speak to the data governance process that's taking place to review the reports. <clears throat> Certainly, yes, we are um, Scott, Zach and I who lead the joint council for CT state data governance are reviewing um, all the reports that are extant now to see which can be consolidated and which will be ported over to an appropriate BI tool for accessing uh, those those reports going forward. Thank you, JD. Um, the next question is associated with uh, banner codes used for for finance, and um, the question asks whether there will be an opportunity to have access to additional finance codes, uh, as this webinar seems to focus on academic um, codes. And do we have somebody from finance that could? Speak Speak as to whether the codes currently used in finance will remain the same or whether they're shifting or changing? Sure, I can I can address that. Um, we do have um, finance codes and we recently went through a chart change this year where we added or changed all of our org codes. Um, so if there's anything that is needed on the campus, um, you can contact uh, SO Finance Support um, and we do have a process to review um, that information. And so if a code is needed, you know, please, please let us know. There are some other codes that um, do have governance around it where we have the FINAC committee um, would review anything that's um, account codes, program codes, account types, those type of things. Um, but we've had those in place since 2018. So we're, we are probably all set, but if you do have a need, you know, please um, email SO finance support and that information will get to the committee where we will review that. Thank you, Gail. Um, the next question is, will students type codes remain the same? And will all students who enrolled in the um, calendar year 22, 2023 have a student type of code in the fall of 2023. Could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, will student type codes remain the same? And will students who are enrolled in 2022, 2023, have a student type code in the fall of 2023. If they were a student, they would still be continuing. So their type code would be continuing. They would still be a continuing student. 
um thank you Lord. so, so that mm -hmm. code will remain the same that code will remain the same continuing is the same but there are a couple that have changed to standardize mm -hmm. we can put more details in the um frequently asked questions mm -hmm. document can't recall off the top of my head the specifics but i believe there are at least one or two that may have changed thank you brenda and we have a question regarding CRM advice. Will courses taken at colleges other than the student's home campus be reflected on degree works or just CRM advice? I can speak for the CRM advice part of that. And I'll let Susan speak to the degree works, but yes, uh, after the transition, uh, all of the students academic history that's brought over to the one college version of banner will be displayed for all users and CRM advice to see on a student's profile. And as far as on degree works, it will be the. Um, whatever is on the students undergraduate transcript is what will be displayed in degree works. And I'll add one more piece to that is if people access the unofficial transcript in banner self service, they will be able to see all history. One of the things that we didn't mention um, when we we're talking about data migration is that the way the data migration is being done, the um, we will have the capability to produce a transcript for the individual campus of any of the 12 campuses, the way it would have appeared as of the end of summer 2023. You in self service have the capability of seeing all of that detail. Thank you, Brenda. And I think as we continue to move forward and transition with the implementation and uh, integration of resources, there will be additional conversations in the different departments and training sessions for the regular users of banner in our systems to um, give them a, a, a more in-depth look at the work that has been done and the results of it for the end users those are all the questions that we had uh, today at the please do not hesitate to continue to put post questions or send questions our way after the webinar. We'll, we'll add them to the frequently asked questions to make sure that uh, they can serve as a resource after the presentation has concluded. And I'd just like to add my thanks to everybody that has been working so hard, whether it's been on the One College Banner implementation, CRM Advise, Recruit, Degree Works. There's so many parts and pieces that are going on. There's people that are working on projects, uh, multiple projects, our, our finance folks, we're doing double duty on finance and AR. I think there's a huge relief there now that finance, it still has its challenges, but it's live and they're not having as many meetings with regards to training and configuration and so on and so forth. And the efforts that people have been putting forth to meet deadlines, to, to get the catalog out there, to be ready to go live, you know, um, I just want to reiterate, success is a must. And there's a lot of work to be done between now and the end-to-end -end testing that begins in February. And that's really at that point in time, for the most part, we need to be ready to go. And so I, I thank everybody for all the work that they have done already. And I'm going to thank you for all the work that many of you will be doing in the upcoming months. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.